Hello YouTube. This is Gentleman Scholar here. I'm going to be brave and try to light this up like while I'm recording. So let's see how this goes. Not bad. Not bad at all. A little more though. This is Capstan in my Cobbit. I think it's a Cobbit. Um, Come on, come on, come up with the name. Cobbit, uh, church warden. Gentleman Cobbit, country Cobbit, church warden, whatever. Anyway, let's get this going. I am smoking. Capstan. I kind of wanted to try it, and all of a sudden I saw, um, Thomas Kalheim's video that he did from, um, Thailand. I said, well, I guess I don't need any more direction there. I'll just smoke some capstan on my next video. I'd like to cover a couple things on my video, a couple things on videos here. Just, um, and I'm not going to worry about the time. Right now I'm drinking Great North Rose, Robust Vanilla Porter. I just got done doing the wood over there, bringing in some wood and got hot. And it's not noon yet, so, but to, I had to force myself to have a beer to cool down, as my friend, my Scottish mate Del Cotton would say. He, he, <laughs> he went he went to some restaurant, he had to force, a, a Guinness was forced upon him, quote unquote forced. Hope I get to meet the guy. He's a, he's a folk musician. He likes his tipple. Comes from Ayrshire. Where Ra I can't even do the accent that Rabbi Barons comes from, their national bard. The one there, the one who wrote Old Lang Syne, Old Lang Syne, where the song was based from. Which, of course, the version that we hear, thanks, every New Year's Eve, and or when the clock changes over. Is um in the Dan Fogelberg Dan Fogelberg version that he steals at the end of his song Old Ang Old Lang Syne. It's not the one. It's not the way it's supposed to sound. That's what I'm trying to say. So where to start? I'm having all kinds of problems having these things lit lately. I'm starting to wonder if it's me, or maybe I just didn't pack it enough or you know what? I don't care. I'm just going just gonna to wing it. Anyway, first things first, I wanted to thank L.A. Piper. He put out a, a video recently. <coughs> oh, don't swallow this. This is hard stuff. This is a Professor J.R. Tolkien's creator of The Hobbit, Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion. His favorite tobacco, and I can't, I can't imagine him. A scholar like him smoking a pipe. But then again, I could see a hobbit smoking a corn cob pipe. And he considers him he considered himself a, a hobbit sort, even though he was not working class, he was not of the earth. But he could relate to them. The British working class folk. Hey! Um but anyway. LA pipe smoker. Listen to his video when he, he called the Shaggy Dog story. To me, a Shaggy Dog story means the X Files. Like, you know, that mythology storyline they had going on kind of led nowhere. Clones and Fox Mulder's sister and the impending alien invasion. It didn't go anywhere. That's a Shaggy Dog story. Expect. But I was going for my walk and the video lasted about 25 minutes. That's a good length for my walk. So, I let the professor talk. I call him professor because he's a teacher. Sounds like a professor. He likes to talk and he's got interesting things to say. 
So, I let him talk. Um, and basically, he, uh, he wanted our company. He wanted to sit down and smoke, and hopefully anyone who was watching would sit down and smoke with him for this Shaggy Dog talk. Now, to me, smoking about, talking about tobaccos and everything is all very fine, and uh, yebos and gauze are all very good, and it's all part of the YTPC experience. However, I like it, I really do like it when someone just sits down and just decides to shoot the breeze about whatever comes into their head, sort of like what I'm doing now. And every now and again he would say, I don't feel like leaving yet. Can you give me five more minutes? I like that. He was just sitting there and he wanted pipe smoking company, even though it was virtual. To me, that is the very... I was sitting down and smoking a pipe. I just cannot keep this lit today. Anyway, that warmed the cockles. I really enjoyed that. So I let him know. I did a video right on my walk and posted it to him. And um, let him know what I thought. And that's what he was kind of that's what he was kind of aiming for. So go on over and keep LA Pipe Smoker Company. Smoking company. He likes it a lot. Next the next best thing for you to actually being there. So This morning. I wake up in the middle, I get up early so I can work out, get that stuff done. I know it's crazy, but on a day off, I don't mind doing it because at least I get some healthy thing done. And have time for other things. When they're early in the morning, everyone's still sleeping. Everyone's got their agenda going. You know, everyone's still sleeping. I can get my stomach crunches or my walk done right around 6 and everything's fine. So that way I can go out shopping or do whatever and not have to worry about competing agendas. I highly recommend it. Excuse me. <sighs> this morning, I wake up and listen to National Public Radio's BBC World Service. They play that in the middle of the night. And I stumbled into the middle of a story. I usually set the clock. I have to fall asleep to something, and then I set it so that the radio turns itself off. And if I'm not completely asleep yet, the fact that it turns off wakes me up again. Anyway. So to get that one last bit of sleep before I woke up, and all of a sudden I hear this gentleman talking about um, his really crappy childhood. Soft-spoken, gentle sort of soul, and eventually talks about how he's like, you know, his father was a violent man. How his mother tried to throw him off the top of a roof because she was an ex-prostitute who was stuck in a really crappy situation, and she had a moment of madness and tried to throw him off a three-story tenement roof. And luckily, The wires and antenna all caught him just in time. Then all of a sudden he starts he starts talking about Superman and how he dove into comics and reading when he was younger to escape from this crappy life that he was in. Long story short. He used Superman as a role model. Um, he made a list of what Superman was and his father wasn't. And he decided that this is what I'm going to be instead of that. I'm not going to let my past define me. And also, he um, had a vasectomy too. So he wouldn't have to have the temptation to repeat the same vicious cycle of brutality on his own child. And I've done the same thing, to be honest. Not because of I had the same background, but I just didn't want kids. Kids are a lot of work, and I don't think a lot of people realize that when they enter into the the realm of 
child, of like family rearing and child rearing, it's a lot of work. And uh, I don't, I don't have the patience for it. But that's that's me, and that's him. Anyway, long story short, turns out I was listening to an interview from a gentleman called J. M. Straczynski, and who he is is um, because he dove onto onto those science fiction and comics when he was a kid. He began, became a writer himself. He, const, he contributed scripts to, of all things, He-Man, Master, He-Man, Master, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, um, a newer Twilight Zone series. Got to keep puffing, otherwise it doesn't stay lit. really coming to like being a pipe smoker. Um, so, turns out he actually ended up writing Superman. And uh, I, he wrote something I haven't read. It's called Superman Earth to Earth One. Um, it's kind of like a reboot of Superman. He also wrote uh, Superman Grounded, where he decides to walk from town to town instead of flying around so he can actually talk to people and find out what his problems are. To be honest, he's not one of my favorite writers. I mean, he wrote sort of a Watchmen-esque tale back in the day called Rising Stars, and I followed it for a while. It was pretty good, but I just kind of got bored with it. But again, not, nothing, not saying he's a bad writer or anything, I just wasn't feeling it. But anyway, he he credits Superman with saving his life. And I, I had my husband listen to it, because, you know, he's like, oh, Superman's a boring character, he can do anything. And um, it's boring. Rather, most people like Batman, because he's, a self, in a way, a self-made man, even though he was born into great wealth. But he turned that wealth into a crime-fighting machine. The Gotham had never seen Gotham City. Oh, and speaking of which, see the Joker if you haven't have see Joker if you haven't had a chance. It's excellent. I think it's a masterpiece. The Joker is what gets created when all of us stop being our best selves. When we all we all, when we all start act when we basically when we when we start when we all give into our jerkier sides and start being dicks to each other, people like the Joker get created. And that's really the main thrust of the story. And it's really you know it's a you know it's a, a zeitgeist affecting movie when everyone's talking about it around you. In comic stores or just in restaurants or everything, so yeah, it's worth the hype. Go see it. But anyway, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that um, J. Michael uh, Joseph Michael Straczynski, that's his full name, he used a fictional character, a superheroic character, to improve his life. And I've always said that uh, stories affect life. This is what we do. Humans, we write stories to make sense out of the world around us. We did it as cave people. We painted, we painted pictures on the walls to like recount the hunt. We told stories around the campfire about the hunt and the things that could get us in the dark and how to avoid those dark things. We've been doing that since we probably even discovered, formed our own language. So, um, basically that's the power of a story. That's what a story can do, especially if it's well told. And I don't know if you've ever seen, um, the Lord of the Rings trilogy, Peter Jackson's, the extended versions, of course, because there's more cool stuff in it. Um, there's a, there's a speech by Samwise where he's like, he goes, we'll be like one of those, pe we'll be like those people in the, the stories, you know, the, the good ones that really, really mattered, where the hero could have turned back at any time, but he kept on going no matter how hard it was. That's the whole point of a story, to teach us how to do the right thing. And that's um, so what J.M. Straczynski did. He taught, he used a fictional character and what he represented to do the right thing, to not become his father. And uh, I'm going to find the link to it, and I'll put it in the bucket if I can... I've never done that before, so... I'll figure out how to do that, and, um... It's only 26 minutes. Listen to it while you're doing something else. That's how I sold it to Bill, my husband. Listen to this while you're eating breakfast or something. And he did. And he got it. I think he got me a little bit. Because I, I basically want to teach him what Superman means, really means, to me, and as a character. And also, how this guy's background was similar to my own. Except I, I haven't turned my, I haven't turned my, uh, 
mine into a lucrative writing career like he has, but I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, so yeah, I, that really, really touched me today, and I shared it with a lot of people online, and I'm going to share it with you. So please listen to it if you want to get me a little more, if you feel like daring to take that step, get into my head a little bit. And speaking of writing, um, now I'm just sailing along all the topics I wanted to talk about. Um, I'm writing a piece of fan fiction right now. I try to write every day in what I call, I keep a journal, I keep an actual journal. This is what happened to me and my reactions to it. I also keep a writer's journal, which is a lot more raw. And, um, and in it goes everything. Anything goes. Um, angry rants at people I don't like, situations I don't like. And it's written in, like, you know, that chicken scratch. You can't even read my cursive. I started writing a cursive again. Because it's quicker. But it's also sloppier, especially if you're writing fast. But I can read it. So I started writing a... Um, two or three weeks or maybe a month ago, I started writing... I had th this fan fiction in my head a long time ago. It's like, I really want to write a story combining who? And Land of the Lost. Because those two... I love Land of the Lost when I was growing up. It's a Sid and Marty Croft production... If you don't know what Slander the Lost is, just remember the Slee Stacks. Tall lizard men. That's the stuff that people remember. But really cheesy special effects. It was written by science fiction writers. Um, I think Ben Bova might have been involved about it. I know David Gerald was the, the showrunner for the first season. He even got the Marshall family out of the Land of the Lost while still, still keeping him in there. It's one of those stories like Gilligan's Island or that kind of thing where if the character gets out of their situation, the show's over. So... If Gilligan and company found their way off the island, the show's over, so you have to keep them there. And they always have to be trying to find a way out, but they never will, type thing. Same with Land of the Lost. First two seasons are pretty cool. Third season is a sharp jump, but I digress. Anyway, I wanted to combine those really cool concepts with Doctor Who, and it just seems like a natural fit. So I started, I started writing the Land of the Lost part, like about a month ago. And I really like where the story was taken. The ideas start to form. You're like, oh, no, I like that idea. I like that idea. I'll write that down. And I kind of aged the characters a little bit from the show. I had... The, the, the family had been there. Land of the Lost is basically a closed universe outside of our own universe. And they're trapped there and they're trying to get out of it. It's got dinosaurs in it. It's got crystal-based technology. These slee stacks running around. And if you... If you in the pylon of these crystal things, if you mess with them, you can open portals into time and space where you could... Other people start dropping in. It's the land of the lost. It's almost like where your <laughs> it's almost like where your uh, socks go in the dryer, and you can never find it again. It's basically like a sinkhole in time and space, and they never fully explain everything. So that's kind of cool. I like to combine that with Doctor Who. And I said I, I want to do this properly. It's like which Doctor? There's been like 13 actors to play the Doctor now. More than that, if you count others. So I'm like, which Doctor is going to be good? to go in this situation. So I chose Tom Baker, which was airing concurrently. Land of the Lost here, Doctor one that everybody knows, with the scarf and the big mop of curly hair. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write him in it, and his companion at the time, which is Sarah Jane Smith, and I'm going to do like a team-up story. And that's what I'm kind of working on, and I worked on it for an hour today, and I was really happy with it. I'm not going to bore you with the plot of it or anything like that. In a sense, that's still kind of being hashed out. Stephen King said it best. When you're writing a story and the ideas are flowing, it's kind of like being an archaeologist. You're kind of like brushing the sand off of the skeleton of a dinosaur. And you don't, oh, you got one piece here. Oh, that's kind of cool. And you keep doing, and you keep, you brush over here. Oh, there's the tail. And you keep going, and all of a sudden this structure starts to emerge. It's a story. It's a story that wants to be born, is in you to come out. And you could, and I could, yeah, it's silly, it's silly fan fiction, you know, I mean, it's not like I'm writing war and peace here, but I'm writing something that feeds my soul and feeds my passion, so it can't be a bad thing. And eventually I'll post it up on a fan fiction, a fan fiction website and see for people who want to enjoy it. Because, yeah, I would like to be a writer, but writer, writing's a lot of frickin' work. It really, really is. And sometimes when I say to myself, oh, I'm going to go write a story, I find myself procrastinating because staring at an empty page is kind of... It's kind of daunting, but I've gotten to the habit of like more often than not just getting down there and putting an hour into that writer's notebook. Just putting a right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Just freaking write it, and then you can sort it out later. It's like throwing clay 
onto that onto that table and just shaping it later. You know, you can fix it later, but you have to get it down. Putting the pen to paper is the hardest thing. And then you go. So that's what I've been doing. The habit of writing. Excuse me, because writing consistently is the most important thing. It's the shaping of it that makes a good story. And if you have passion in your story, maybe someone else will find something in it to enjoy as well. And that's what Straczynski was talking about too. He goes, he's reading these books and something he read resonated with him and he started crying. He goes, I'm crying at something that's not even real. This writer has elicited emotions in me that made me start crying. I want to do that. I want to tell stories like that. By the way, I wanted to mention, he, J.M. Straczynski is the dude who created a Babylon 5. Have you ever seen that? I don't know if you've ever seen. He is also a scriptwriter on a Clint Eastwood movie called *The Changeling* with Angelina Jolie, which is a pretty cool movie too. Not the cheeriest, but it's still worth a watch. Um, and that's the secret of writing. Writing can transform us. It can transform the writer. It can transform the reader. Any creative endeavor is basically magic. I think the purest form of magic, getting us to imagine things. And um, and, if, and I'll, I'll go into Grant Morrison here. If you believe something strongly enough, if you write enough, you can maybe even make what you're writing become real. Or you, it has echoes of it in the universe. And then, I don't want to bore you with quantum theory and everything like that, but um, I really do believe the human mind has the ability to affect the outside world, the physical world. And I'll go into Grant Morrison. He's my favorite writer. He's responsible for the show called Happy, which involves a... It only ran two seasons, but this guy's imaginary imaginary friend is from childhood. He's a little unicorn. It leads him into these sick, depraved adventures. It's pretty cool. But Grant Morrison, he's either insane or he's a genius because he believes that superheroes are real in the sense that they exist. Okay, these great beings from another plane of reality, wherever, transmitted their consciousness in a two via comic books. Superman Action Comics number one, 1939, to um, try to help us to be better people. That's the whole point of being, that's the whole point of superhero fiction. To do the right thing, to become a, your better self, really. That's the whole point. Yeah, it's cool that they all wear capes and they all have superpowers and the whole thing, but the whole point of it is that they're hero. They weren't put, they, any heroic fiction, they weren't put into these situations on purpose. They're called to do something, even though they don't, Batman didn't want. Bruce Wayne didn't want his in that alleyway after they were coming out of a movie theater. I'm sure he would have liked to have had a happy life, maybe a privileged life, but instead, to deal with his grievous pain, um, he channeled his fortune into fighting crime, dressing up like a flying rat <laughs> and fighting crime. Um, that's what heroic fiction is. point of Superman, by the way, is that, yeah, he can shove planets around, he can lift up trucks and stuff, but that's not the point of Superman. The point of Superman is this, and I keep, I'll rattle on about this for as long as possible. He could be a dictator. He could be, in, in some stories he is, in other universes, a dictator and, or a terrorist or a, a despot, but the thing is Superman chooses to do good with these powers, all of these powers, and he chooses to do good with it. He, take, he takes the harder path by choice, and that's the whole point. And that's the whole point of writing, to make sense of this very confusing world that we find ourselves in. And with that, I'm going on 25 minutes now, so I'm going to leave it here. I would suggest this, uh, with a longer video, a longer pipe smoking video, I would suggest this if we, you know, do it when you have some, listen to a longer video when you're doing something else, like going for a walk, or cooking your dinner or something like that, That's or any long thing like that. That's when I listen to, like, say, um, Holy Smoking Pipe Padres videos. He tends to put out longer videos. And also, um, Matches 860. Whenever I listen to his Friday Night Live chats, I tend to be doing time. Like, um, writing a letter, doing whatever. I just get to overhear his freewheeling conversations with other people. That's the whole point of pipe smoking and sitting down for a chat. So that's what I, that's what I would suggest you do. When I also put the link to that radio spot, Listen to it while doing something else. So you can listen well. Because I know it's a busy life. We all have things we need to do. 
You don't have 25 minutes to waste listening to me talking about freaking superheroes and shit. So multitask. Do it while doing something else. Anyway, I just wanted to um, thank you, the YTPC, for being who you are and all the, all the great people that comprise it. A um, couple of shout-outs real quick. Three, River, Three Rivers Piper YTPC, Dale Piper, and of course... North, Northeast Piper UK, just do, don't think, because if you, if you, if I thought about doing a pipe video and setting it up, I wouldn't do it. So just do it. All the best, my friends.